All right, does everybody have a Bible this morning? If not, you got one in the pew there in front of you. And if not, I'll put it up on the screen. I'm such a good guy to you. I'm not going to let you walk out of here without seeing the Word of God. Amen. By the way, I got sent, I got, I get gifts every now and then. One time I got, uh, I got a can, a tin can with a label on it that said can of King James. Because I use that term every now and then. Steve Hammond brought that up one time. He got into an argument with somebody about the Bible. And he said, I was just about five seconds away from opening up a can of King James on this guy. You know, that means give him scripture. So somebody sent me a can of King James. It's empty, but it's apparently it's full of milk and honey. But anyway, somebody sent me this. And it's, they've made the label up. It's a troll away spray. Because we get people online that are trolls. They don't believe the Bible. And they hate us. They're going, yeah, that Mike Hoggard, he's a racist. He hates black people. Get away. So it's, it says, new milk and honey version, powered by King James. And it smells pretty good, too. So all y'all trolls. And I got a cup holder right here. Just pop it right in there. I ain't going to put up with that nonsense. Amen. Hey, there's people that want to hear the Bible. Amen. So you trolls just my... And it, I don't get that. If you hate my guts, why are you listening? Why are you sitting there watching me? I don't, still don't understand it. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. You got a Bible. Say amen. If not, I'm, you're going to leave out of here with Bible in you. I'm going to sow the seed of the word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes at the end of his life. And God allowed him to have all the money. God allowed him to have all the women. God allowed him to have all the wine. God allowed him to have loud parties. God allowed him to have... Uh, there were kings. Kings across the world. Kings across the world would make a journey to Jerusalem. And they would bow to King Solomon. All that was done by his daddy... King David, King David put down all the enemies and put the fear of God in them and said, don't mess with the Jews. Don't mess with Israel. Amen. And so King Solomon is living high on the hog and he goes to, and he sins. He sins. He gets into all this mess with all these women and he starts following their pagan religions, building temples for their gods and all that stuff. And God lets him do it. And at the end of his life, King Solomon, King, he said, God, let me keep my wisdom. He said, God, let me keep my head about me. And he said, I'm telling you, I had it all and it's not worth it. There is nothing in this world that's going to bring you the satisfaction. There's only one thing between you and, and death and that is your creator. You need to remember your creator in the days of your youth. That's what he writes at the end of his life. Not, he didn't write it as a young man. He wrote it as an old man. He wrote it with the wisdom and the scars that age brings to a person. Because we've been beat and knocked and bruised and bumped and scarred. And we've done stupid things in our life. And the older we get, the more regrets that we have. And we try to pass that on to a younger generation and tell them and plead with them, don't do this stuff. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do something else stupid. There's plenty of stupid to go around for every generation. Amen. So pray for the young people. Lift them up before the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Solomon said two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. Now I want you to pay attention to that. Because I'm going to preach on the threefold cord this morning. And who remembers... Now this is the Christian's threefold cord. Who remembers what the first cord was? Who remembers? The first chord of the three was what? Okay, I'm going to go back and pre-preach it. Here it is, 10 minutes till 12, and i got to go back and fill in the gaps now from, what, a month ago? The first chord was Bible reading. Bible reading. When you are afraid of getting in sin, the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. 
Am I right? With the Bible will keep you from sin. The Bible will get your heart back right with God. Reading and hearing the, the word of God preached and read to you. The entering in of the word of God will give you light. It will give you wisdom. It will give you strength in your life when you don't have any strength. So he said, if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. There's a reason why we have church. Sunday morning. Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible, uh, Bible studies, revival meetings, Bible conferences, homecomings. The reason why in the middle of the week, I'll be busy doing a Watchman broadcast or Pastor Mike online or something that benefits the body of Christ is because we need it. We need it now more than we ever needed it. This world is wicked, is it not? This is a very fornicating, adulterous, wicked, sodomitish world that we live in. And our children are falling. And our marriages are crumbling. And people are dying. People are getting shot and killed. People are getting... They're, they're having wickedness poured out all over them. And we need more of this Word of God, not less of the Word of God. Listen, if, you're, if you decide, oh, I can be just as good a Christian. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to pray. I don't have to go to church. But I'm just as good a Christian as everybody else. You're lying through your teeth. You are lying through your teeth. God knows it. And down deep inside, I think you know it. You're just making excuses because you want to make excuses. Fact is, the first thing that goes wrong in your life when you decide I want to get back into some sin is you quit reading your Bible. Because when you read your Bible, God will try to talk you out of it and you know that. So what was the second one? The first one was Bible reading. The second one was prayer. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. If you will let God establish in your life these three things. And here's the words I'm using. If you will let God establish these. Because I've been, I've been in this for a long time. I've been in church. I've been in this church a long time. I've seen people come. I've seen people go. I've seen people stay. I know what works and I know what doesn't work. If you think that coming to church should be me as your life coach, giving you tips on how you can recreate your own mind so that you can find success in life. I'm here to tell you this is not a self-help meeting. This is a meeting of sinners. Say amen. You are surrounded. I want our visitors to know you are surrounded by wicked, hell-deserving sinners who need the grace of God in their life or they will not make it. Amen. I won't make it. You won't make it. And I'll tell you something. You could be a preacher and fall apart. It's been done. I could stand here for 10 minutes and give you names of preachers that I know that have fallen out. And I mean fallen out big, big time, hard. And may not ever come back. If you're all alone when you fall, you have nobody to pick you up. What are they selling on TV now? This life alert deal? So that now that if old people whose bones get brittle, they fall and break their hip if they are alone in their house. God bless her, Sister Betty Walsh. Her daughter Joyce told me, she said, when mom goes out, she goes with one of us girls. Bless her heart, she's almost 80 years old. She still wants to keep driving her car. We're going to let her do it. But if she goes out, we go with her. Because if they hadn't been with her, God, she could have passed out driving her car on her way to the beauty shop instead of passing out at the beauty shop. That's the grace of God. But had she been alone, passed out, who would know what to do? So it's best, listen to me. The Bible says a just man falleth seven times. Is it not possible 
for each and every one of us, and I mean each and every one of us, to fall. Is that not possible? Is it better to do it with people around you or all alone? It's best if you fall when you've got help to pick you back up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, help me preach this message. I love you. I love your word. I need it. Lord, I hated. We miss. Here it is, three Sundays. That tells me the devil pulled us out three Sundays. I hate it. I hate what could have been done, could not be done. And Father, we need here because we need to be here. You didn't, you didn't just bully us and command us, say you better go to church or you're going to hell. Father, we need to be here. Help us, dear God, to see the relevance and the need in this day of being in God's house with God's people. Because all of us are going to fall. All of us. And God, we need somebody around us when we do. I need it. So, Father, bless those who I have in my life that when they watch me go down, they'll help me get back up because I need it. So, Lord, help us to understand how bad we need not just two chords, not just one chord. That won't work. The threefold chord is not quickly broken. Help us to see the need, dear God. Bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. So first is Bible reading. The Bible is the word of God. Second is a prayer life. Evening and morning and at noon, three times a day, he said he'd pray. Daniel prayed three times a day. Paul besought the Lord thrice. All of this is following a pattern in the word of God. So I believe you ought to pray. And, I, and prayer doesn't always mean close your eyes, bow your head, get on your knees and fall on your face before God. You can pray while driving a car. You can pray while operating machinery. You can pray while working a computer. You can pray while you're eating dinner. You can pray before you eat dinner. You can pray before you go to bed. You can pray yourself to sleep. God does not, listen, God does not get mad at you when you're praying and you fall asleep at night. I'd rather be talking to God when I go to sleep than, than everything else that can go through my mind while I'm going to sleep. Somebody say amen. God does not mind you going to sleep while you talk to him at night. It's okay. God knows you got to get rest. And by the way, he'll still be God listening to you first thing in the morning. He'll still be there. Somebody say amen. God is it. So prayer, Bible reading, and then assembly. Turn your Bible to Hebrews 10, 25. Let me get rid of some trolls here. There we go. Get them gone. I'm going to wear this. I'm going to wear this thing out. Hebrews 10, 20. Hebrews 10. Turn there. The Bible says in verse 21, we have a high priest. A high priest over what? Over the house of God. I am not the boss of this church. I am not the head of this church. I am only a figure symbol of the real head of this church, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are saved and you're born again, then Christ is your high priest and he is the high priest over the house of God. Somebody say amen. He said, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. Why are you here? Why did you come to God's house? Why did you come to church? If you're coming here just to be seen, you're in the wrong place and you're doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. But if you come here because you know you need to be here, draw near with a pure heart, he said, in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What is the pure water? It's the Bible. The Bible is the pure water that we get washed. You come here this morning to get clean this morning. You come here to get right. You come here having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. That is, you've been out in the world rubbing shoulders with lost people all week. And don't tell me it doesn't rub off. Your mind gets so full of the wickedness that is surrounding you. It wants to come out of you. And you need to get your conscience clean by coming and praying and getting your Bible out in the house of God and being around other sinners who are here for the right reason. He said in verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. How many of you believe the Bible? Oh, that was weak. How many of you believe the Bible? That's getting better. I want to hear the people online. That's not bad. Let us look at verse 24. 
Here's why you should, here's why you should be in the house of God with God's people. Let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. So you're not doing well. You don't feel like coming to church. That's when you ought to come to church. And the, listen to me now. The people who are here should welcome you who are wounded and crippled and ravaged by sin. This is an emergency room. This place, this is a, what is the new word for it? Urgent care. At the emergency room, and you come in all banged up from a car wreck, they don't say, what happened to you? Get on out of here. We don't want people like you in our place. Let that be them other churches. Let that be everybody else that will not welcome the wounded and the broken and the sinners. Let that be them. Let it not be us. Let us welcome those who are wounded. Let us welcome those who need to be in God's house. Somebody say amen. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. I want to provoke you this morning. I want to push you out the door and say, go serve Jesus this week, wherever you go. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't forsake it. Don't do it. Be here. Be in God's house. Being in God's house is better than not being in God's house. See how simple that is? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. As the manner of some is. Those stupid churches that say, well, the Super Bowl's going on. We're not going to have church today. You idiots. God didn't save people with a stupid Super Bowl. He saves people by coming to the house of God and hearing the word of God. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see, do you not see the day of Christ coming? Do you not see the rise of the Antichrist in his wickedness in this world? Do you not see the rise of filthiness and wickedness in our communities affecting our homes? Do you not see that? We see the day approaching. And he said, so much more. It's not time to start going to church less. It's time to start going to church more. Somebody say amen. And by the way, I promise you, I am trying to do everything I can in a week's time to get out as much of fresh Word of God as I can for God's people so that you don't have to miss out on anything. You say, well, I don't want to listen to last week's sermon. Fine, I'll give you a brand new one come Tuesday. I mean it. I mean it. I want God's people to have fresh oil in their life, to have a fresh Word of God in their life. Because we're out rubbing shoulders with sinners and lost people. And they, by the, we need to shine in front of them. Not be dulled by the temptation of what they're doing. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 2. There's one. Get a troll. I'll get the devil out of here. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. I want to tell you, listen. There is a conspiracy... I am, look at my eyes, I'm a wild-eyed, crazy conspiracy guy. See it? Crazy. I think there is a conspiracy to keep you out of the Word of God. I think there is a conspiracy to keep you from praying. What is it that now they can't do in public schools? Read the Bible and pray. Do you think mankind came up with that on their own? No, 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 no. There was a devil. There was a dragon. There was a serpent that worked through evil men to get prayer and Bible reading out of our public schools. We've seen it. In our lifetime, we've seen it. When I was a boy in school, we have a lady here that went to high school, Lisa and I. You probably remember in fifth grade, the Gideons came by and handed us all a little red Bible, New Testament, King James Bible. In fifth grade, in public school. They can't do that anymore. It is a shame. This town is full of churches but we can't give Bibles out in our own school. 
There is a conspiracy to break the bands. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Listen, we're being, it's, it's not the people that are doing this to us. It's our elected politicians. It's our mayors and our governors and our representatives and our senators and our city councilmen and our aldermen. It's our judges in our courts that are ruling against God and against the Bible everywhere. The rulers have taken counsel together against the Lord and against the anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their what? Cords. So God said, I will hold you in my power, in my kingdom, I will hold you. I will hold you with a threefold cord of Bible reading, prayer, and church attendance. All three of them together. God said, I'll hold you. I, listen, I'm not preaching. I know how it works. I know that when I drop my Bible, quit praying, and don't want to be in God's house, I can be here and not be here. And when those three things happen, I am not a good person. I'm not. There is always going to be, people, a conspiracy, an evil, dark work against you to break the cords that's binding you to God and binding you to your Bible and binding us together. Am I right? Let me ask you a question. You ever been offended by somebody in church? You ever had your feelings hurt by somebody at church? You ever had your feelings hurt by the preacher? I can do it. I'm, I'm capable of doing it. And I've had my feelings hurt by people sitting in this room. And what happens is the devil says, I'm going to break that cord. Oh, boy, this is hard. It's not easily broken. If I can, if I can, uh, let me go back to this. Come on, Mike, hurry, hurry, hurry. If I can get, there ought to be an, if I can get it unraveled. If I can get it unraveled, I can break each cord separately. And then I've got it. Do you know, listen to me, I want you to look at your preacher. I, I can sometimes tell when you ain't right. Because usually, you ain't here. Or you may be here, but you're not really here. And there is a devil who wants to bust us all up. What's the threefold cord of a family? Brother Milton, I love you. I love you because you got your family in God's house. The threefold court of a family is a husband, a wife, and their children. What is the devil destroying in the white folks' neighborhood, in the black folks' neighborhood, in the brown folks' neighborhood? What is the devil doing the same way in every neighborhood? He's breaking the families up. Am I right? Children growing up without a daddy. Being abused and or molested by some man that does not belong in that home. Or neglected. Not loved. So children grow up wild because they've never had the threefold cord of a family. 
I'm t- this Bible's right. This Bible has got it figured out. What's wrong with America? The cords are being broken. Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to run through these verses. How much time will you give me? Do I get, do I get double time because we missed last Sunday? Philippians chapter 4, I beseech Yodas and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord and I entreat thee also true yoke fellow. See what the Bible calls us? Yoke fellow. That means the same rope I got around my neck is the same rope around your neck. And when we hang, we're going to hang together. <laughs> Amen. Yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I mean, think about it, the easiest thing in the world to do is to pray, read your Bible, and come to church. By the way, today is not the day of rest. I'm working myself to death up here. It's the, it's the first day of the week. It's the Lord's day. This is the Lord's day. Amen. What better day to come into God's house than on His day? He gets the first one. He'll give you the other six. Amen. Psalm 60, uh, 26, 9. Gather not my soul with sinners. Hey, instead of being in church, you could be out there with lost people. Sinners. You could be at the tavern. You could be at the, at the dope party. You could be at the sex fiend's house. You could be anywhere with sinners doing what sinners do and be lost and your desire is God. Do not gather my soul with sinners. Gather me with the righteous. Psalm 50 verse 6. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. That's the new covenant. And the heaven shall declare his righteousness for God is judge himself. Psalm 102, 19, for he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner. You, you come to God's house and you groan because you're in prison. You're in chains and you want them to loose those that are appointed to death. To declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together and the kingdoms, we are here to serve the Lord. Somebody say amen. Psalm 107. Listen, you might as well just get happy and clap a little bit. It don't bother me. Here, here's another troll. Get him out of here. Put your hands together every now and then. Amen. Hey, that's all right. Psalm 106. Verse 47. Save us, O Lord God, and gather us from among the heathen. God called us out. To give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Psalm 107. Boy, I can just I can just roll these scriptures out. Amen. I like it when I can preach and just preach nothing but scriptures. Oh, give thanks unto the hey, say that louder. I like you. I don't care if you are from St. Louis. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered them out of the lands. From St. Louis. From Chicago. How in the world did you get to be a Cubs fan? You ain't from Chicago, are you? What were you thinking? Cubby's going, I feel sorry for him. So I'm going to dedicate my life to the Cubs all my life. It did pay off, I guess. Hey, he's gathered us from Ferguson, from Minnesota, from Wisconsin, from Jefferson County, High Ridge, Cedar Hill, Hillsboro, Festus, Crystal City. Huh? California. Oh, my. You people put pineapple on your pizza. I got no mercy on you, all right? I love, hey, young man, I love you. I'm going to pray that God does something with your life. I mean it. Your people need Jesus, they need Jesus. 
So I'm going to pray that you young men will get Jesus and preach to your people. I can't reach them. You can. You can. He's gathered us from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. See them Minnesota people are down here with them Arkansas people. And we all talk different. That's why the Kenyans can't understand us. We don't get our accent all straight. But we wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. You used to be alone. You used to be alone. Why would you, after you get right with God, why would you want to be alone anymore? We were in a solitary way. And they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And He delivered them out of their distress. And He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. That means the place where we dwell in. You, some of you on the line, you cried and said, God, give me a pastor. And God gave you a pastor that loves you, that cares about you, that wants you to have the word of God, not me, the Bible. Why forsake it? After you've been given it, why forsake it? Why would you help the devil break the cords that are holding you to God? Under Shiloh shall the gathering of the people be, Genesis 29, 10. Matthew 13, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast out into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered it, the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. God threw a net out and he caught you up. And when he went through the fish, he found you and he said, I'll keep, you're a keeper. Johnny, I'll keep you. I will put you in my basket. For my kingdom and my glory's sake. God could have thrown you away and you know it. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Here he is. Here he is. Luke three seventeen. Whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor, but will gather the wheat into his garner. That's what he's done here. He's gathered us together. Acts chapter 14, when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. Now he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles and there abode long time with the disciples. Would somebody right now stand and tell what God has done for you? Somebody. I mean it. Come on. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 16, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him and store as God hath promised for him that there be no gatherings when I come. He said it's to be on the first day of the week. Here we are right here, the first day of the week. Right here. You know what this is a picture of? There's seven days in the week. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. There's been six thousand years of history. There's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ. That's going to be the Sabbath day. You know what God's going to do? He's going to renew everything. He's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth. Because the next time we gather, we might be gathering together with Him in heaven. Turn your Bible to Revelation 7. And when you turn there and I read it, I'll let you go. I promise. The quicker you, the quicker you get there now. Whatever is in that offering place is going to smell really nice, Joe. Revelation chapter 7. I've had some tough days in the past few weeks. 
God knows what they are. And I've been on my face crying for, before God because of what he's done with our church. To, to be able to feed, to be able to give out 5,000 pounds of food doesn't just, you don't just do that. That God has to be in it. And I've just asked God that he would continue to let our church do that. I'll never, I'll never meet those people this side of heaven. But I want to meet them on the other side. So what if they're black? So what if they're poor? So what if they don't act the way we act? So what? Christ died for them. And he loves them. And he gave them, God gave his only son, his only begotten son for them. God has given us so much here, and they have so little there. And so it's only right that we're able to give so much there. Because one of these days, look in your Bible, Acts 7, verse 9. After this, I beheld a low, great multitude. You're not alone. You're not alone. There is a great multitude without number, which no man could number. Look at your Bible now. Of, of, of what nations? The whiteies? The honkies? Just the honkies? Nope. White folk, black folk, red folk, brown folk, yellow folk, every color of dirt that there is, God saved them and He puts them in heaven. There just ain't no purple people. Because there ain't no purple dirt nowhere. All nations, all kindreds, that means kinfolk, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands. They're waving that palm branch. That palm branch is what they build the tabernacles with back in the law days. And that meant, God, hey God, we want you to come and live in our little house. It's made out of palm branches. It ain't much, but we want you to come and dwell with us, God. In our little church, it ain't much. But God dwells here. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Seven things. By the count of them, there's seven things there. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. You see, it started with amen and you finished with amen. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence come they? Now you read your Bible. You look at your Bible. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation. What trials have you gone through? What loss have you sustained? What people are you mourning over that have gone? What troubles have you had? What sin has infested your life? That's the tribulation that God has brought us all out of. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He sitteth on the throne and shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more. <laughs> Neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them. Listen, you people in Turkana, I love you. You live in a desert. And it's hot out there. We're going to be in a place where it's not going to be hot no more. Nor any heat. 
for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. And shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I just want to say to you this morning, your pastor loves you. I know what sin does. And I know you've all done it. So have I. But when you get to heaven, you're going to be in church all day. And there ain't no night, so it's going to be all the time. You're going to be in church, and you're going to be with God's people, and Jesus is going to feed us with his own hand, and we're going to be in church forever. So why wouldn't you want to be in church here? What, he what heaven do you want to go to? The one that's like your pitiful life where you're out in sin away from God? Or the heaven where you're standing next to the throne? And Jesus, his own hand is feeding you. Is that the church you want? Then make it that church. Make this church like that one. That's what I want. That's the church I want to go to. So you folks from St. Louis and Ferguson, you keep coming. You folks from Arkansas and Potosi and Fredericktown. God forbid even Florida and Alabama and Georgia and whoever. Okies, we'll take Okies too, amen. Texas, we'll take Texas people. We'll take them all. I want the worst people in Missouri to be able to walk in those doors and know that they're going to be fed by Jesus himself. A church full of sinners, four sinners, so that they are sinners no more. They're saints. Now you get that wrapped around your heart. Bible reading. Prayer. Church attendance. Even the folks online, they know. There's a sermon I preached about three years ago called Home Church and Evangelism. Look it up or we'll send you a DVD on it. Because I had a family contact me this last week saying they tried every church within I don't know how many miles of their house. And they said, we can't find one that preaches the Bible. So can we be part of Bethel? I can't turn anybody away. So they're watching. And we teach them how to be church where they are with us here. Because without it, we'll all fall. We'll all fall. I've done it. And if it wasn't for this church, I would not be here today. That's why it means the world to me. And I want it to mean that same thing for you. I want us to pray.